So welcome everybody. This is a database systems lecture. My name is Jens Dittrich. And today we will be talking about crash recovery. I changed the agenda a little bit. So last time we looked at query optimization and query processing. And then I promised we would look at MVCC. So that's a variant, that's yet another algorithm to um, implement concurrency control. Maybe we look at that later, probably the last week in the semester, because what I think so much is so much more important is this is crash recovery. And that's something we will be looking at today. And uh, so the plan for next week is actually to extend that a little bit then to um, topics like high availability, robustness, how make systems really robust against uh, failures. And uh, yes, there are current events that inspired me uh, this morning actually to think about changing the agenda. And that is um, in Germany, we have these uh, discussion about the teaching platforms. So for homeschooling, well, and these platforms don't seem to be too stable. And there are many reasons for that. There are also political reasons for that. But uh, some of those reasons have to do with database technology. And I would like to um, give a little tutorial next week on well, at least from the database side, what, 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 how should this be done? Yeah. I hope things are done like that. I don't know. Um, let's hope for the best. But today we look at a very fundamental technique for crash recovery. And that's one of the pillars, one of the best things that ship with database systems. And that is automatic crash recovery. So <clears throat> why would that be of any interest, crash recovery? Well, a database should be able to handle certain error scenarios. And uh, the easiest scenario you may imagine is power failure. Huh? Currently, power goes away. So what happens if you boot your system again, if you, uh, if you start off the database system again? What is the state of the database system? What is the state it is in? Yeah, what is the state of your data? What does it mean uh, with relation, in relation to asset, huh? atomicity? Yeah? transactions that were still processing. So did they change the database uh, just halfway and the other half wasn't changed? Things like that, yeah. Fire, uh, fire flood, uh, flood uh, earthquake, tsunami, burglary. What happens with your data in those cases? Hardware error. What happens with your data? Uh, we, had, we touched that briefly already when talking about RAID. We've done an array of independent disks. Uh, that's um, a hardware mechanism can also implement it in software, but, but that's a mechanism to to um, to make storage more stable. Yeah? Software error. Yeah? What happens if there's a, any bug in your um, application program or even the database itself? Yeah? What happens? Or, or the janitor's dog could be another uh, problem. The janitor's dog in the data center peeing on the database server. Yeah? Then then you may have a problem in the dog as well. So. Um, you want to recover our database system, but actually the recovery is actually something you find in, in, in any software or many modern software products in, in, in the sense of the undo functionality. Yeah? You, you edit something like in a, a text editor and you want to be able to undo it. And uh, so some software products allow, offer you to do that like, like one step back, but there are other software products allowing you to go back as much as you want to the earliest version. Uh, to, if you started with an empty document or an empty image, yeah, you can do it back to the very beginning of, of what you ever did. And that's a very good way of doing it if, 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 if software does that. Yeah, backup copies. Yeah, that's something you do to, um, yeah, you create copies of your files, whatever your files are, in order to be able to recover them. Yeah, if you have any problem with your with your laptop, yeah, that's a very uh, uh, layman's way of reco recovery. Uh, then you see it in, in file systems like uh, Linux file systems, uh, extended file system. They have journaling, a journal file system, which keeps track of the metadata, allowing you to. Um, so when I <laughs> when I was at university studying computer science, basically the file systems were slightly different. So you always had to be very careful, at least in Linux, to um, to shut down the machine nicely. Uh, uh, really make sure that all data was stored on disk, because if you didn't, and then fired up the, um, the uh, start of the machine again, then it would do all kinds of magic on the file system to make sure to find out what the, what the status of the file system. And um, yeah, that changed once people introduced journal file system. Journal file system do something very similar to what we, uh, what I will be explaining today. Yeah? So that's that's basically the um, implementation of crash recovery on the metadata, not the content, and that allows you to to 
easier understand what the state of your file system in that case uh, is and how to get back to a consistent state. Yeah, another um, thing, and that's how you should not do it, is um, when you have a machine, uh, so this happens for instance in Apple, when, when Apple is updating some operating system component, um, you, you get a message all of a sudden, do not switch off. <laughs> I'm doing an important update, please user, don't, don't switch it off because I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, and that's a failure actually, because software should be built that at any point in time, Whatever happens, you should be back. You should be able to easily get back to a consistent state, to a state where you can can continue working. And, and these kind of messages uh, telling you, yeah, you may switch off the, the power, but I don't know whether you will be able to recover. Um, that's a failure. That's not not how it should be done. No. Okay, so let's briefly recap asset. Um, why there might be a problem with asset. So again, here are the four properties we talked about that at length. Also in the recap session at the beginning of um, the semester, so we have atomicity, all or nothing. Well, that may be a problem, yeah, because if transactions were halfway um, doing stuff and then some of that was put into the database store, other the other half was not, as mentioned before, that might, may be a problem. So atomicity is an issue that may be affected in error scenarios. Consistency as well, yeah, foreign key constraints, stuff like that, or this uh, prominent example that uh, you do a you do a money transfer in a bank uh, from one account to another, and the sum of all accounts in the bank should be the same before and after the transaction may be violated in such a scenario. Isolation is not so much of an is issue here; it's kind of orthogonal. But durability, yeah, this this contract, an asset that well, once the database system told a user that the transaction was committed. The deal of durability says there's no way the database may ever lose that information, may ever lose that change. So the database system has to make sure that whatever happens, it told you it is committed. I committed your transaction. The database system must be sure that it will never ever forget the data. Well, and that's that's interesting, right? If, if the data center, uh, if there's no earthquake and the entire data center with the database is gone, uh, yeah. What about durability there? It's a very, very relative measure. Yeah? Or you have an asteroid hitting the data center. Hmm. So durability can only be guaranteed if in any point, um, in any place there's a replica of your data, which typically means that data centers with important data are replicated like 30, 40 kilometers at least uh, away, um, distant, with distance between the data centers. So if there's a catastrophe, a tech catastrophe, on one data center with high likelihood, the other is not affected. Uh, but it depends on the type of uh, scenario. Yeah. But durability is um, super hard to achieve. Uh, you kind of cannot fully guarantee. It's like with security. There's no perfect security. There can't be the perfect durability. Yeah, local errors. So we have um, uh, different types of errors. And one is a, a local error. That's a term for a scenario where in your application, you eventually, you start a transaction and then you say, no, abort. Uh, I'm not gonna continue with that transaction. And if you already performed updates in a transaction, you must make sure that those updates, those changes you did in, in, in the transaction don't end up in the database store because that would be violating asset, obviously. Yeah. Or what may also happen, yeah, you have deadlocks, yeah? concurrency control. If you remember these lock-based protocols we had in the undergrad lecture, so two-phase locking and this stuff. Yeah? So there may be deadlocks. Some database system to resolve the deadlock may say, oh, I'm, I'm stopping that transaction in order to resolve the deadlock. Yeah, and then that is an abort triggered by the database system itself, and you should be able to handle that. Um, yeah, so that's uh, a local undo, as we call it. So re you remove the persistent changes done by non-committed transactions. Yeah? So uh, the transaction that was a mid-flight, now for whatever reason, for, for an abort, triggered by the, um, by, by the user or by uh, concurrency control, you must make sure that whatever changed must never end up in the database store. So here's an example, so how that may look like. Here we have the timeline from left to right. Here's two transactions. Um, so here's one transfer of 100 euros from account A to account B and another transfer running from uh, of 300 euros from account C to account B. Hmm? 
and uh, this ends before. So this committed already the green transaction here. Well, so you must guarantee durability. Yeah. But here, this um, here in mid-flight, there was an abort. So whatever happened before in that transaction must not be persisted in any way. Huh? That, that's very important. Yeah, more critical is, of course, the loss of main memory. Typically, that's a power failure scenario. Uh, but the database system should be able to restart. Yeah, you shouldn't be forced to dig to uh, dump files and, uh, I don't know, painfully try to recover whatever the database state was. But no, that should be done automatically. The database system does all that magic. And the tasks must be, of course, basically, it's, an, it's either undo or redo. Yeah? Undo meaning you remove the persisted changes done by the non-committed transactions. So everyone who uh, has not committed, who, who didn't commit yet at that point in time when the crash happened, whatever you did, transactions, that, that stuff must be removed. And on the other hand, for the stuff, uh, for the transactions that committed, yeah, all changes they did must be persisted. That's durability. And you must guarantee that this stuff really ends up in the database store. So this is the main task we will be looking at today. Undoing stuff of transactions that didn't commit. Those transactions are also called loser transactions. Loser transactions are transactions that did not commit. And winner transactions are the ones that committed. Yeah? So for loser transactions, we may have to undo things. And for winner transactions, we may have to redo things in the database store. Yeah, here's an example very similar to the previous one, just the, the type of scenario is different. But assume here the crash is due to a power failure, and then, yeah, what happens? Yeah, so you may, and both for both transactions, you may have to do something for both. Yeah, that's important to understand here because even though this green transaction committed, we don't really know at this point in time uh, whether the changes done by that green transaction are only. Uh, available in main memory or where available in main memory or whether the database system actually pushed them to a persistent medium yeah, to do disk or SSD or whatever. At this point, we don't really know. So you must, you better check, you better uh, check uh, the state uh, of those changes. Yeah? Were those changes persisted to disk? Yes or no? Can I go back to those changes? Can I really guarantee durability? And actually, that's not a question. Uh, it, it, is a, it is the job of the database system to say, no, I must guarantee. However I do that, uh, and how that is done is uh, what today's lecture is about. And here, it's, here we are in the undo world, uh, as mentioned on the previous slide. So again, that's a loser transaction. Uh, so non-committed transactions, it's a loser transaction. So the crash, the crash happened in mid-flight. Uh, and if this transaction did anything to the store, we must remove those changes. Uh, that's guaranteeing asset. OK. Um, it, it can get, it can become even wider than that. Yeah? So what if we not only lose main memory, but we actually lose the database store? And then what? <laughs> yeah. um, that's a problem, yeah? like, like this data center scenario uh, I just uh, told you. What does it mean? How can I restart a database if I lost the store? Yeah? What data do I still have? Do I have a copy somewhere in a different data center or uh, in a safe somewhere? Yeah? So I better have, uh, otherwise all the assets, maybe all, all, all the information of the co of the company I'm running the database for may be lost. So that may be, yeah. So, so here you see that that may be very crucial. If, uh, that's the reason for having backups and stuff. Uh, that's a longer story, but typically, um, that what you do again is you you uh, create those replicas. Uh, maybe they are slightly out of date, but you have something rather than nothing. And maybe better uh, a version that's one day old, then no version whatsoever. Hmm. So, and that brings me to, um, yeah, how do we do that? So the, the fundamental thing we need to, uh, to talk about today is logging. And that's also referred to as, um, um, it has different names, we will get to that. Yeah? So first, first, first uh, let's look at logging. So basically, um, let's uh, switch off the camera. So this is one way of seeing a database architecture. Yeah? So basically, you have a user, and this box here is a database management system, and has different components. And of course, underneath there is um, hardware, uh, could also be drawn outside the box, 
but let, let, let's assume it's inside the box. Yeah? So they have hardware, you have a store operating on the hardware. You have an indexer taking care about the indexing mechanism on top of that, and then you have a query optimizer. And we talked about all of these different parts, hardware, store, indexer, and query optimizer. And now uh, the um, extension we do uh, basically is we, we have to do something that we consider um, a special type of storage, and that, that's called stable storage. So what is, um, th that's basically an extension to, to the store we have had so far. Now I'm telling you, there's another type of storage we, we, we must be using for database system, and that's called stable storage. And the idea of that is basically in the following, um, that whatever change you do, you put it on stable storage. And stable storage in, in, in the simple um, case can be a second hard disk. So maybe assume you have one hard disk for the actual database store and you have another hard disk for, for the stable storage. And maybe uh, let's first explain that by using an analogy. Assume you pu publish a book. Uh, and um, so once uh, this book is out, typically what happens is people read the book, uh, hopefully, and see, hey, there, there, there's a bug, right? So that you will start um, with a change log. Every publishing house does that basically for, for books. Yeah? So readers report, hey, here, there's a bug, there's a typo, whatever, whatever. So basically what you do is um, here a typo like that would be recorded like saying, okay, I'm page 23 of this book. There's this typo. So that's what I found, the, the dead base, but it actually should be database, right? You should better change that. And of course, the book is already out, so you can't change that really. Uh, so yeah, we can't just for each and every typo you find in the book, you don't want to uh, do, uh, do a new edition of a book, at least if the book is printed on paper. Yeah, if it's an electronic book and um, Kindle and whatever electronic version um, format you're using, that's easy, relatively easy to update. You could do that for each and every type if you wanted. Huh? But for a print book, that, that's more difficult. Huh? But basically, what you create, create is you create a new version of the book in a way. Huh? So you, you keep collect, collecting changes and um, create those books. Eventually, you actually issue a second edition. So the second edition would incorporate all of those uh, changes you collect, collected in the log file. Yeah, you call it the second edition. So when I show here this uh, one dot first edition, you don't do that. Yeah, that's kind kind of a virtual edition. Uh, basically, what I'm saying here, if I want to have the full truth, the most recent version of uh, of of my data, I have to read those two things together. I basically have to uh, take the first edition of the book, one dot zero plus the changes in the change log. And, and the combination of that gives me the, the most recent version. Uh, eventually, I collected so many um, changes that I issue a second edition. Uh, but basically, you, you keep um, collecting all of those changes in that uh, log file, uh, that's, uh, in this uh, um, change log, uh, or this correction file, I don't know how publishers call that, uh, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah. and. Um, Basically, this is type of um, file on, uh, on this extra storage, we, we, we call that um, a log file. Yeah? Ships also do that, yeah? Yeah? like uh, old pirate ships. Uh, the captain had a big book, a uh, log book, yeah? and there he wrote, oh, we saw a whale, or we saw the end of the ocean, and we almost fell down the ocean uh, from, from flat earth or something like that. Yeah? Stuff like that. It's the same idea. You lock your actions. You lock uh, what happened into into such a file. And um, so basically, what that means is, if you have a, a file where you record uh, all these changes, actually th that file contains a complete truth of your database state. Yeah. If you assume you start with an empty database system, and then you keep inserting rows and then uh, maybe even in the creating schemas and um, table schemas, attributes, stuff like that. Yeah. So if you record each and every action in such a log file, you could eventually start with an empty database again and just replay the actions that are available in the log file to get to the, exactly the same state. 
So it gives you the recipe how to get back to, um, to a specific state. Uh, and that means actually in this world, the database store becomes redundant all of a sudden. The entire truth is already available in the log. Yeah? The, the, the database store is just kind of an efficient, uh, condensed representation of what the log uh, actually contains. Yeah? And that's a very important uh, thing to understand. So the log is a redundant, is redundant information about the database, um, what you did to the database, the actions you applied to the database, in a different format that's uh, maybe not as efficient as, as looking up the store directly, but it, it allows you to get back to the current state of the database store. Yeah, and uh, this has some ramifications. So one is this log can be uh, read and written sequentially. No? Recall um, sequential I.O. is super fast, yeah? as, we, as we learned in the, when talking about different um, hard disks and, and SSDs. Yeah? You can read that uh, sequentially and basically try to replay it relatively, um, at least with respect to I.O., it's relatively fast. It provides nice features like versioning. Yeah? Most database systems, modern database systems, allow you to version, to look back at old data. Now, how was how did that table look like like one month ago? Yeah. And you can do that in, in, in many SQL dialects. You do something like you do whatever you um, SQL query, select star from tra -la 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 -la, whatever you want, and then as off, yeah, just append as off and a timestamp. And then the database system will return you the data as of the time, point in time, uh, when the, uh, how the data looked like at that point in time. You can, you can uh, um, query historic data. And this uh, previously, um, had fancy names in different products in Oracle, and it was called Time Travel or um, Total Recall. I think there was a Schwarzenegger movie um, at the time. So um, Total Recall, you can remember each and every state, each and every version of the database system. This is also, these, these logs, um, if you ever um, um, run into um, distributed database systems, you will see that's a natural extension point for, for distributed database systems. We won't go into detail today, but if you ever hear the term log shipping, that is what people mean. Yeah, if you want to replay state from one computer system to another, you typically ship uh, the tail of the log and the log, uh, and that's called log shipping. And uh, which has become more popular recently, so-called permission blockchain technology, those people often talk about so-called ledgers. They basically mean what, what I would call a log, a database log. Yeah? So if you once you understand what a log does in a database system, you probably will understand a lot what a ledger in a permission blockchain or even the public blockchain system is actually doing. So it's nothing new in that regard, at least. Okay. So with that, let's look at some more examples of how that works again. We, um, what we will be using in the following is uh, so something, basically the database store, we keep that in a file at the end of the day. Yeah, so that's a read and write uh, file. And the changes we, we put in a log file, and that's an append only file. Yeah, I can only append stuff to that, but I can never change anything that's available in the log file. That's not allowed. Yeah, I can only, that's an append only mechanism. Whereas here I can update in place yeah? on the left side. It's a readable uh, file that I can read and I can write yeah? any byte in that file can be uh, changed. So um, an important um, principle we will be following uh, um, for, for the content, for, for, for this lecture and for the algorithms I will explain later on is called uh, right ahead logging, uh, val, uh, how that's pronounced in English, val, val, I don't know, right ahead logging. And uh, it's basically a contract saying we can do whatever we want, but one thing we have to guarantee, and that is whenever we put something in the log file, we want to put something in the log file, we must first append it to the log and persist it, and then put it to the store. So the other way around is not allowed. You're not allowed to first put it in your store and then into the log file. That's forbidden and that may break certain algorithms. So whatever you do, you better make sure you first write it in the log file. And um, this actually gets more complicated. This is a very this is a, um, simplification of what's actually happening because, uh, well, we're in the storage hierarchy. 
Yeah, and of course, we have parts of the database state is in memory, some of it is on disk, and uh, the same may happen, may happen for this log file. There's a database buffer keeping some of the pages from disk uh, available in memory. So that's the situation. We had that uh, already been talking about storage. So what does it mean for logging? Because um, actually it's more something like that. Yeah? So you have the store with main memory and uh, flash or hard disk, and you have this stable storage where the log file is, is, is kept. Huh? You know, many things may happen. So um, when you start, let's assume that's our starting situation. So we have the same first edition of this book on, on flash and hard disk and in main memory, a copy of the book, okay? Now we perform changes. So what, what will happen is, well, we have this change. If we wanna do a change on page 23, this typo, so it's important we first put it here. But, hmm, yeah, what does it really mean? I mean, because we didn't persist it yet, it's a main memory. If we have a power failure, it's gone. Yeah? So well, what's fine, what we, what, what we should do is we persist it and then we apply um, the change to the store. So once we wrote it, we forced it on disk. That's very important. Yeah, you should know that if you actually issue a write command to a file, in many operating systems, that doesn't mean that it's actually written. It may, may be in a RAM disk. Yeah? You really have to f-sync it, yeah? force it to disk to guarantee that this log uh, entry is on disk. But once I did that, following this uh, write-ahead logging principle, um, I can now apply, apply the change here. So you see there's a slight uh, change here. Now I'm calling this edition 1.1. On disk in the store, it's still edition one. So I have a more recent version here in my memory, basically a dirty page, if you want, a dirty book, an entire dirty book, not all, only an entire um, dirty page. And then eventually I can write it out to hard disk for the store. I don't have to. Actually, this protocol doesn't force you to write out this um, state that's available in my memory to the hard disk in the store at all. Yeah? The only thing it's saying is whenever you change something, you make sure you persist it first um, in the log file. Yeah, so here we actually write it down uh, in the store on the left side. Yeah? But, but what you could also do, and that would also be obeying um, the, the write ahead logging protocol is the following. So again, same start scenario, you um, create that entry, that change uh, log entry, now you first change it in the store. It's kind of violating what I just said, right? Yeah, but not really because write ahead locking is actually only uh, critical when it comes to persisting. As here I'm performing this change in main memory, I didn't violate anything on the level of persisting. Yeah? So I wrote it to stable storage. I wrote, appended it to the log file in main memory, it wasn't persisted yet. Then I changed it in main memory it wasn't persisted yet. So as long as I can guarantee that this is now not written out, one edition 1.1 1 .1 is not written out before writing out the, um, uh, this, this, log, this uh, log file here, then everything is fine. So what I must do in the following is I persist it, I persist the log file, and then I can override the, the old version and the database store with new version. Then I'm still in the write ahead logging world. That's fine. Yeah? So those are two examples of how you could use that protocol. Here's an example of how to not do it. That would be violating write ahead logging. So how does that look like? So um, again, same um, scenario. We um, start by creating this entry in main memory now we also change it here in the database store, and now we write it to the store. This is violating the, the write ahead logging protocol because um, here I'm violating that it first must be persisted. Um, uh, the log should be persisted first, must be persisted first, rather than overriding it in the store. Yeah? So that's violating write ahead logging protocol. Yeah? Okay, so what this principle says is when committing a transaction, you first force the log entries to the log disk, to stable storage. Then you write out the changes from the database store to its um, associated disk. Um, so that's a, the basic idea here, but there, there's a twist to that. And that is, um, if you remember how the database buffer works. So the database buffer sometimes um, has to make room for new pages and has it may have some dirty pages if you think about the eviction algorithms. Yeah? 
Yeah, so assume you want to load a certain page. There's no room left. You have this choose page algorithm kicking out one of the pages. And one of those pages may actually be dirty. Yeah, so before kicking it out, uh, you must write it back. And that may happen here again. That, 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 that may happen here as well. So if, if that's a dirty page as well, that was changed by transaction, we didn't uh, write out uh, the lock uh, uh, information yet. You first lock, write out the lock information. Yeah? And that, that's the second branch, uh, second uh, scenario. So you write back a dirty page in the da database buffer Right ahead locking must be followed and that is force all corresponding lock entries to lock to the lock disk because every lock entry that was created uh, by while changing this by while um, making this clean page uh, turning this clean page into a dirty page all those lock entries must be forced to disk otherwise you would be violating that principle you know? and only once you did that then you're allowed to write back the disk um, the, the, this uh, dirty page to the data uh, based store. Uh, that's very important. Uh, so the high level idea of that is really the version in the log is always younger or equal the version in the persisted store on um, the pers persistent medium. Uh. So there's a question in Discord. What would happen if a change in the stable storage is persisted, but there's a failure before persisting the new data in the store? Don't we have an inconsistency between the change log and the actual data then. Yeah, if in doubt, um, the truth is always a log and would overturn um, what, what's in the store. Yeah, if you have a problem with an element in the store, um, that may, um, the log is always, um, the log always beats the store. Yeah? We look in, and when we look at the, um, the algorithms later on, you will see how that uh, principle is applied. So let's, so what I'm building up in the following, I don't know, 60 minutes is a, is a very important algorithm, a beautiful algorithm, but it, it, it puts together many, many, um, many Lego pieces we used and, and learned about in this lecture. Yeah? So we'll hopefully um, um, see many things um, uh, or recognize many things you've seen before. So um, now we learn about logging, so you can log the information somehow on stable storage on an extra disk. And yes, it's a good idea to have a disk that's very fast with respect to sequential I.O. Yeah? If you have a disk for your a database store that's not that great when it comes to um, um, sequential I.O., for the log disk, you better have one that's very good for sequential I.O. because that may, may be a bottleneck. So I have to drink some water. Okay, so we will look now into different types of logging. And um, there are basically three different types. Um, um, a little bit more, but, but the general overview have, have three types. Yeah? So the one is called physical logging. And what is that doing? So assume, so in the following, I will assume the following scenario, you have a page, let's say it's 42, and has certain, um, information on whatever, some string fields on, on camera technology, whatever, lens, aperture, camera, that's a typo, obviously, depth of field. Yeah? And that is uh, the page in the old state here on the left and the page in the new state on the right. And there's a transition between the two pages, obviously. Yeah? So um, how can I keep track of those that change? Well, the easiest way is to, to um, basically keep a diff of the state. So I could keep um, um, the state of certain bytes. It can be the entire page. I can just record the entire page. That's how it looked before. That's before image of the entire page. Or I keep the uh, I keep a snapshot, a copy of, of the page, how it looked afterwards. Yeah, that's yeah. also that's representing the state after the change. So I've, the entire page, of course, represents the state before the transition happened and after it happened. But it's kind of inefficient, yeah? I mean, it would be enough to just keep the, diff the, the bytes that changed in the before and the after version. And that's what we're doing here. So basically, I'm saying, okay, the only thing that changed uh, here were those two letters from KE to CA to fix that typo. So basically, what I could record is... Um, for page 42, I have to record a 
the image um, at, at that specific offset on the page, maybe that's uh, 367. And I'm saying, okay, there's two bytes that changed from before to after. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm memorizing the information KE, that's the before image, and CA, that's the after image. So for each and every change, you basically just keep the bytes that how they were before and afterwards. And with that, of course, you can reconstruct um, the changes in the page. That's called physical logging. The physical state changes of pages are logged without caring about how those um, changes were triggered in the first place. There's, there's an operation behind. Uh, there's some update in the SQL update statement that triggered that stuff in the first place. We don't care at that point. We, we, we look at the pure physical level uh, for, for logging. You know. So that's, that's the first. The second is, um, so that's one extreme. And there's another extreme that's called logical logging. And logical logging doesn't care about the state as of as in the before or after image. Logical logging just looks at, okay, what is the high level operation yeah, that, that, that I have to understand to, to, to um, what, what, was, what is the high level operation that, that triggered that change in the first place? So basically for this scenario, we had um, yeah, assumed that the data represents this table camera lingo with two attributes. And basically I did an update on, um, on row with term ID zero, changing this string to the other string. That's a high level operation, not SQL yet, but, but a high, le high level operation of, of that update. So basically if I record that, I will be able to replay that eventually. Yeah? If ever in any point in any at any point in time I will have an old version and I want to get back to I want to get to a newer version, I can replay that action here. I can apply that action to the old version of the page and I, then I will be I must be in, the, in this uh, a newer version of the page. Yeah? So that's called logical logging and that's not necessarily limited to a single page. So I could put here actually in the log an entire SQL statement, an entire transaction, uh, doing zillions of changes to, to zillions of pages in the database system. Uh, basically, when you think about what a database system is doing, uh, yeah, you eventually have a state and then you issue SQL queries. Yeah? So if you just record that this is log of SQL uh, queries, transactions that were uh, executed on the database system, yeah, you will be able to replay the state of the database system. And that may happen in logical logging. So those are two extremes. And there's something in the middle that's called physiological logging, which means that's like logical logging. So you have a high level operation the, um, describing the transition. However, it's restricted to a single page. So whatever I put in the log here, it must only affect data on one specific page. And this scenario, it's page 42. Yeah. And if you go back, so what's the difference to logical logging? Well, here I didn't record the page ID, so I didn't even know which page was affected. And typically um, you can't restrict it to a, a specific page, so you don't care about that. Yeah. So that's the difference. Logical logging really, you don't care about where the data has to be changed. It's anywhere in the database system. And this um, intermediate thing, physiological logging, saying, no, I know it's page uh, XYZ, 42 in this case, and there's a update I'm performing described like that. And how that is done, what that actually affects on the byte level, I don't need to know at this point in time. That will be something for before and after images. So, so those are the three types of logging. And there are certain trade-offs um, that you can um, understand here. And um, basically, uh, one is with respect to the log size, and that also corresponds to the I.O. time to read the log. So if you think about how much information do you want to put into a log, yeah? so these different methods have um, different requirements. So, and uh, that, that's one axis, that's the x-axis, so the log size, which uh, correlates heavily, of course, with the I.O. time to read the log, yeah? the bigger, the longer it will take. And the y-axis shows uh, the log entry processing time. In this case, I wrote down minutes uh, arbitrarily, but just um, to make the case here, assume this is, is a disk-based system. So disk-based systems 
may have to perform a lot of our operations um, to um, to assume you read the log. Yeah, you want to uh, replay all of those actions. Yeah, and uh, if, if each of these actions triggers basically um, that that you that you have to read a page, change it, and write it back. Yeah, so that may take a lot of time. Yeah? In particular, if, if the data sits on the disk, oh, no, no, no. Hard disk, or even on an SSD. Yeah? And basically, the trade-off you will be seeing is something like that. So, if you do logical logging, assume you wrote entire transactions into the log. That's typically not that much of information that has to be stored, so the log size will be relatively small. However, of course, when you want to replay that, you have to basically perform all the work that the transaction needs to do. You have to redo the entire transaction. Yeah, so that may be very costly. Yeah. In contrast, if you have physical logging in the sense you have before and after images, you don't have to do any computation. You don't have to do any query optimization, any uh, query processing. You just have to read the page, apply the change, write it back over. Uh, that's all you need to do. And that's faster in, in, in this world in, the, in terms of um, faster on the database store applying those changes. Um, but you probably, you can construct scenarios that are the opposite, but in many scenarios it will be that like the log size is, is bigger. Uh, assume that, for instance, assume that many elements were inserted or updated, that everyone got whatever, an increase, a salary raise, a salary raise by 10%. Many, 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 many pages are affected and that can be expressed easily in a, in a short transaction. However, if you record all the changes on a byte level, as before and after images, that's a lot of information. However, the advantage would be that you just read the page, apply the change again, write it back if you want, you don't have to, database buffer will handle it, um, but you don't have to reissue the entire um, transaction. Yeah. So that's one trade-off. And this um, trade-off for disk-based systems, um, that's what, we, what we're seeing here, however, it changes quite a lot once we go to Main memory systems. In main memory systems, now all these uh, access go down. We have much faster processing times of transactions, of course. That if you assume that all the data um, is available, uh, the data is stored, is available completely in main memory, but you will see that, um, so typically you have a, a scenario like that where um, we now all of a sudden don't want to do physical logging anymore, but we can do logical logging. Uh, so as um, reissuing a transaction is super fast in many cases anyway, much faster than on a disk-based system, then it typically pays off to do logical logging, even though you have to um, uh, reissue that query again, uh, often makes a lot of sense. So the message for you here is it depends on the type of system. Yeah? If it's a main memory system, you want to go more towards logical style logging, whereas in a disk-based system or any system is slow storage um, uh, media, maybe physical um, logging would be something. And in the following, we will look actually at, uh, at the mi mix of those different techniques. So, so here we are. Okay, so here's a logic logging example in my memory. That's how you, how you could do it in a database system. Um, typically, what you would put, in, assume you have a SQL statement like that, yeah, and of course uh, um, the trivial way of logging the SQL statement would be to put the, the text, the SQL text in the log file. You could also put the query plan in the log file. Why not? That's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's the physical, um, it's already the translated version. You could also put that there. Yeah? That would also speed up um, replaying it, of course, because then you also wouldn't have to do query optimization yeah, when, when replaying. Yeah? But the easiest way would be just, I write the text of the SQL statement in the log file. But what I do here is, uh, what you can do is uh, obvious, is a, a simple form of, dic of dictionary compression. I could say, okay, for every query pattern, for every query pattern that comes in and that I haven't seen before, I store it in this query dictionary, give it an ID, and in the actual log, I just write the query ID I'm referring to. So this is query ID two and uh, the parameters I'm using. So here, this is a parameter A in that case. Yeah? And if I'm able to, um, to get to the dictionary like that, I can write a very compact logical log. Huh? So that's, that's one idea 
idea you could do in logical logging and you see that's um, a very um, sh very small or can be very small actually okay um, so with that I will go into the actual Aries method but we will do that after the break so um, that's a method that was proposed in the early 90s there was uh, work leading up to that different types of algorithms happening before but that then that's a method that's still used in many disk based systems um, if you look at that after the break I will continue 10 past 1 I will be available um, on discord in the audio channel if you have any questions see you there
Okay, let's continue. So, what is Aries? Um, so the algorithm has three phases we will be looking at in detail. The analysis, the redo, and the undo phase. And what's this graphic, and we see different variants of this graphic in the following. Does is it processes the log file from oldest to youngest. So that is the log file here, the dotted line. That's where it started, that has a first log record. It processes it somehow, and then here's the last log rec record. And the last record uh, also means that's the point in time where the crash happened. Yeah? So after that, no other log record was written. So all we have is a log file. And what do we do with the log file? And there are three phases. The first is the analysis phase, reading the log file from left to right. Then the redo phase, also reading from left to right, but starting a little later. The idea is we only need to start from the point in time where there may be a problem in the database state. So that's the earliest possible change that created a dirty page. So meaning that is the, uh, the first point in time where there, we may see a page that doesn't reflect the current current with respect to the last log record um, state of the database systems. So we don't typically don't have to um, um, perform the redo phase from left to right from, from the first record again to the last record. We start somewhere in the middle. I'll explain how that works in a moment. So, and then there's a third phase, the undo phase, and that reads it backwards, the log, yeah, from the crash backwards to a certain point in time which is a bit hard to determine because it um, depends on the uh, transactions that didn't commit at the time. We will look at that as well for the moment. And notice, um, if some of you heard about checkpointing, we don't do any checkpointing, whatever that means. Just ignore it, just for, for if some of you know it, no checkpointing at the moment that will um, be introduced later on. Uh, so we, we start really, with, we have to process the entire log and, and analysis uh, parts of the log and redo and parts of the log and undo. That's all you need to know for the moment. And the Aries algorithm uh, needs some helper structures. So one is a transaction table. What does a transaction table do? It basically has an entry for those transactions that haven't committed yet. Yeah, everyone who already committed, you won't find that in the transaction table. But everybody who's there, all transactions you find here, those are transactions who are still ongoing who are still doing stuff, who haven't successfully um, committed. That's the idea of this table. And the table is relatively easy. You just have the transaction ID, a unique ID for the database system, allowing you to um, identify transactions. So each and every uh, transaction submitted will get a unique ID. And the last LSN, um, that's basically an ID for the so LSN is a log sequence number. Uh, maybe uh, we go, uh, when you look, maybe I first explain this one, maybe it's easier because otherwise you won't understand uh, uh, log sequence numbers. Uh, so when you have a log record in general, so the stuff we write to the log files looks as follows, have the following format. That's um, the transaction ID that uh, triggered this log record and the type of log record, we will have different types. Um, so we start with an update log record. Um, then there's a previous log sequence number. So that, that and, and so typically transaction will trigger multiple log records to be written out. And we have a backward chaining here from log records um, to the previous log record. Yeah, backward chaining. So this is basically just a link back to the previous log sequence number. But what is the log sequence number? That is a uh, ID, a key, a unique ID for each log record in the file. And yes, of course, I could write it in the file, but if it's a file anyway, well, implicitly the offset in the file gives me a key. Yeah? So the offset of the log record is the log sequence number. Yeah? The op if you have one file for the log, just the offset there is my log sequence number, and I can use that as a key, as, uh, as in the... Um, in a relational table, basically. Yeah? So basically, this transaction table points me to the offset in the log file uh, where I would find the log record that was um, most recently seen for this transaction. So that's the latest, the most recent log record for transaction one I have seen while processing. Yeah? 
So that's the latest change done by this transaction. Huh? Um, yeah, then the other structure is uh, the dirty page table. And that works slightly different. Um, so the dirty page table semantically um, tracks pages that may have changes that are, didn't make it to the database store yet. So wh wh whenever you um, touch a page and change something, it becomes a dirty page if you don't write it back to, to, um, to disk. Yeah? So if you did the change in the database buffer, it's a, data, um, a dirty page. And at that point in time, you will create an entry in the dirty page table. Yeah? So you keep uh, the page ID, uh, you have a unique ID for each page in the database system, and you keep the LSM, the log sequence number of the log record that triggered that in the first place. Yeah? That, that um, is the reason for this page becoming dirty. And the important contract here is if there are further changes to that page, further changes being applied, you will never change that uh, recovery LSM because the only thing we need to know here is the first the first change that let that uh, page become dirty that we have to trigger here. Yeah? Um, so that's the two structures uh, we will need in the following and, and use heavily. Uh, maybe just a side note. So if you write out the dirty pages to the disk again, you will remove it from the dirty page table, of course. Yeah? Assume you have a background thread writing out the dirty pages um, to the database store. Yeah, then you can remove it from the dirty page table because it's not dirty anymore, of course. And um, yeah, another assumption I'm making in the following that, so pages, as, as pages typically contain tuples, um, many, many different tuples, it may be that some of those tuples were changed by, transaction, by loser transactions and some by winner transactions. So a page may contain data that was touched by non-committing and committing transactions at the same time. Yeah, that's very important. Um, if you don't um, need that feature, you actually don't need uh, an Aries style, Aries style algorithm. But the idea in the algorithm is really to support this kind of situation, that you really have multi-threading and concurrency um, on a tuple granule. Yeah? Individual tuples can be processed by certain transactions. And even if tuples uh, for different transactions sit on the same page, uh, Threading still works, yeah? so you, you won't lock pages. You will only lock individual tuples in this world. Okay, then let's look at the log records. I showed that slide to you already. So we have um, this general format of a log record as I explained before. So this previous LSN again, that's a backward chaining, uh, um, a linked list to the previous log records. And everything else I explained. So we will look at. We will, I will um, have a slightly simplified uh, explanation of Aries here. We will have three different types of log records. Let's start with the update log record. So what does an update log record um, store as information? So the same as uh, the standard log record. So the type is update. Yeah. Signaling when you, when you read the log record, you want to know. Oh, that's an update log record. I understand. Okay, good. Yeah. Then the, the page ID that, that is affected by that log record. And then there's the redo information and the undo information. The redo information basically gives me um, the recipe on how to reapply the change to that page. So if I have an old version of a page, if I now reapply the redo information, I will get to the new version. And the undo information is the backward direction. So if I have the new way, um, version of the page and I want to get to the old version, I can somehow apply the undo information and then back to the old page. Yeah? So um, that's the idea. And of course, then you can make a decision on, okay, how exactly do we store the log records? Because previously I talked about logical, physical, and physiological logging. So what I will assume in the following is that the redo information contains physiological information. So a high level operation that is restrict to, restricted to the specific page ID. And the same I will assume for the undo information. So the undo information is a high level operation restricted to that specific page. In the um, 
there are other more uh, advanced uh, ARIES methods that don't require that. Actually, there the unknown information can be purely logical and not physiological, but th let's ignore that. So I uh, simplified it here a little bit uh, for the sake of um, um, making it easier to understand. Uh, ARIES is complex enough, yeah? You, you may have figured by now that uh, you may need a, a few rounds and uh, I, I highly recommend you to, to, to join the lab on Friday to, to really understand uh, the, this method. Uh, it takes some time. So it's all physiological. All the log information, all the redo and under information is physiological. So with that, let's, let's walk through an example. What happens in this algorithm? What happens um, not during crash recovery, but actually during normal operation? So what the method does is during normal operation in the database system, it keeps track of this transaction table, it keeps track of this dirty page table, and it keeps track and it does certain changes to all of the database pages. So again, I wrote down the, um, the format of, of the log record. So that's the general format and that's an update log record. Let's start. This is the initial situation. That's the pages we have in the database buffer. And now we start doing changes in that database. So what happens? That's our first log entry. So what does it say? There's a transaction with transaction ID one. Yeah, okay. There's no previous log record associated to that transaction. So that's the first, first uh, change this transaction is trying to do. It's an update log record. So it's changing something. And we have the redo information on the logical level saying, okay, A is A plus one. And the inverse is A is A minus one, of course. And um, if you go back to the old state, you say you see here A was 77, now it's 78. So I perform here the, the uh, I show the log, log entry and the change in the database store at the same time. Again, recall, write ahead logging. So we first write out the log entry and then uh, we apply it to the store, but I'm showing it here at the same time. So the value of A changed from 77 to 78. And interestingly, here I also record um, this log sequence number of that log record in the header of the page. So each database page in its header con um, has a version number. So what is the version of that page? And that version is the log sequence number. So that's the most recent change that was applied to that page. Yeah? And you can directly look up that um, information if this is an offset. Yeah? So in this example, I'm not using real file offsets. I just use logical number numbers. Um, otherwise, it would totally blow up my example. Yeah? Um, so this is a logical ID now, logical log sequence number one um, column. And that, that's the contents of that rather than this uh, offset in the file. It makes it easier to read. Yeah. So you see before there was no log sequence number recorded, no version number. And now we have a version number all of a sudden. Yeah. You see that the transaction table changed to, okay, here we have an ongoing transaction, transaction uh, number one, and that's the last log record we've seen, number one. And the dirty page table um, gets a new entry, that's page 42, and that is the log sequence number. And that will never change in the following. So even though we, we may see other um, log records changing the page, this number will never change. It cannot change in, in, in this scenario, unless you write out the page in the background. So let's continue. That's an, uh, another log record now for a different transaction. That's transaction two. It's also an update log record and it changes the same page, 42. Yeah, as I said, there can be more than one transaction operating on the same page. Changes B from whatever it was before, 55, right? Here it's 55, changes it to 58. This is redo information, physiological redo information and physiological undo information. And we append something to the um, transaction table, uh, the, the uh, transaction two is added with the last LSN of two. The dirty page table doesn't change. Huh? If I switch off the camera, you see there's nothing added because yeah, still we know that already log sequence number, log record number one made the per page dirty. So there's nothing to update here. So here's the uh, next record that will touch page uh, 46. 
Uh, again, also here for the second log record, we, we um, updated uh, the log sequence number, we, uh, the version number of the page was updated, and that will happen for each and every of those log records. Yeah? So here's an update on page 46, changing the version number here to three, changing this value, increasing it by two, and so forth and so forth. So that's normal operation. Those are update log records. And you will see you update those transaction tables and the 30 page tables accordingly. Okay, here um, you write a commit record that's um, basically signaling that this transaction was committed. So when you later on analyze that, you will find out, oh, transaction two committed, over. Uh, I mean, you have to make the difference here somehow. Yeah? yeah, if you don't find an entry, yeah, you just have update records and you never have commit records. I mean, you wouldn't be able to, to, to d differentiate um, the transactions that committed from the ones that did not. Yeah? But the important change you see here is once you write out such a commit record, so let's go back to this state, there is no commit record, just the update records. Once I write the commit records, I remove that transaction from the TT, from the transaction table, because um, the transaction table should only show the ongoing transactions. So when I commit it, well, it's not ongoing anymore, it, it is completed, it's committed, so I can remove it from the transaction table. That is a contract T. Yeah, that is how these tables are maintained in, under normal operation. And um, now, yeah, that's, sorry, that looks a bit cluttered, this slide, but I just, uh, I think for this algorithm I thought, let's rather put more information on the slide that you can reread it back home. And let's ignore this orange stuff for the moment. Um, so basically it's most of this repetition of what we've seen so far. So we had this, um, general format of a log record here. Now we have the update log record that's there. And now we have another type of um, log record that is a compensation log record. And uh, so here previous LSN is the same, transaction ID is the same. Here this is just saying, okay, that's the type, compensation. Uh, I also have a page ID. And then the interesting thing is there's no undo information. There's just the redo information. Previously, we had the redo information and the undo information. Now we just have one, which is a weird name, redo the undo. And the reason for that is this is um, a log record that will be executed in the redo phase, only the second phase of the algorithm, but never in the undo phase. And it basically um, records changes that were done while recovering. So if you go back to this previous example, here I only wrote out log records under normal operation. But eventually, if you actually have a crash, and then you start um, applying certain changes to the database system, but what happens when you're recovering? So assume you crash, now you, you run the Aries algorithm, and then it crashes again. What happens? Yeah. So the algorithm can even survive that. It's ro robust enough uh, to survive a crash while trying to recover. And that is what uh, these compensation log records are for. Yeah? So basically, when repairing, recovering the database system, you write out those compensation log records, allowing you to survive a crash while recovering. Isn't that cool? Uh, and um, yeah. You will understand how that works in a, in a moment. Yeah? But the, the, um, the major change you're seeing here is um, there's not a redo, undo, there's just one, one information. Um, that's it. And there's the undo next LSN. Uh, that is a link to the next log record to be undone for this um, transaction, so standard uh, log record. Okay. Um, what comment? Yeah, that's basically I wrote that. Uh, you can ignore that. Yeah, we only have physiological log information here, so um, I simplified it already. <clears throat> so these compensation log records, what they do is uh, for each operation that was undone, yes, yeah, so the loser transactions perform changes, possibly. Short drinking pause. So the, the loser transactions that are removed, the, the changes of loser transactions are removed from the database store. Um, and that's done by this um, Aries algorithms, 
algorithm in the undo phase. So you keep track of that. And that's where the compensation log records are good for. Yeah? So it's an internal log record written out by Aries, actually. Um, but now if you uh, do re repeated recovery, the trick here is that those undos will then be done in the redo phase already. So the information that you created in the first place to remove actions from loser transactions will only be done once in the undo phase, and then it will be pushed to the redo phase. Sounds weird. Yes, it is, but it's cool because it allows you to only do a high-level undo operation once, translate it into a possibly lower level, lower level in the sense it's more like a physical style operation, redo phase, and then do it in the redo phase if you crash again, if you crash again, huh? just in case it doesn't have to happen. Huh? So that's an important thing you will need to understand also for the lab on Friday. Uh, that may happen, or that, that happens with uh, this compensation log records. They're not executed in the undo phase. No, they're, if you find a compensation log record in your log, you do it in the redo phase, but not in the undo phase. Huh? Those uh, compensation log records were created in the undo phase originally from uh, by the Aries algorithm, but that happens once. And if you read the log again and find one of those, you will execute them in the redo phase. Yeah, that's an important trick in the algorithm. Okay, um, so here's a visual explanation of uh, how this may look like. Um, so. Here we have two transactions, so one with, a, um, with this, this um, a thorough line and one with the dashed line. They, they have a, a certain interleaving of actions and you see the crash here. So transaction one committed, so that's a winner. Transaction two did not commit, so that's a loser. So the actions performed by um, transaction two have to be removed. And then basically what you find on the um, log record level is something like that. So you have this backward chaining, those are the pref ls ends yeah, across the different transactions. Yeah? So you have a backward chaining within the log records for each individual individual transaction. And in the undo phase, um, you write also write out those compensation log records and you also have these uh, undo next ls end uh, telling you what is the next uh, undo log record um, that I have to consider for this specific um, transaction. Okay, so let's look at the, our example when we now incorporate our compensation log records. Maybe uh, oh, there's one entry in the page table that's overlapping with my camera, so I'll switch off the camera. So that's the situation. Let's assume now we, there's a crash. So like in the previous slide, we have a scenario where one is a loser and one is a winner transaction. Transaction one, the red one did not write a commit entry, so it's a loser transaction. You also see it directly by looking at the transaction table. Yeah, you crash, you look at the transaction table. Well, that's that's uh, um, loser transactions, obviously. Yeah. What I mean by looking at the transaction table, um, if you don't have it, you you um, will be able to reconstruct uh, that table. Huh? Uh, we will see that if we now if we go into more detail in the analysis phase. Forget about that. Yeah? So for the moment, we have two transactions, uh, the loser transaction and the winner transaction. And now what? Yeah? So what you have to do is the changes done by transaction one have to be removed. So what the algorithm does is it compensates, it, it writes out the information, information about that change. So it does that in backward order. So the first change that has to be undone is this one. This has to be undone first, and um, you see it here. Um, the compensation log record is written. It's uh, giving you the page ID, and it's basically copying over the undo information. So the undo information you previously found in the standard uh, update record is now copied over to this compensation log record here. Yeah, that, that is what happens there. And if you crash again and you read the log, what you will um, do is you will, um, of course, eventually also um, remove the second update or undo the second update here, this one, as yeah, second and backward order. Yeah? You always do, do it the other way around, of course. Yes, you first did this one, that triggered that compensation log, uh, log record. Then you um, undid this one, that triggered this compensation log record. But um, this, if you find out that this, this 
undo operation you did here in lock re uh, record number six didn't make it to the store, that will already be detected in the redo phase. So even though semantically this compensation lock record is undoing something, if you crash again and find the lock record, that will already, already be fixed in the redo phase. That's very important to understand. So, okay, with that, I think we can look at a high level overview of those phases. So what do these phases do in Aries? Three phases, the analysis phase, again, recall they read it from, uh, analysis reads from left to right, the entire log for the moment. It reconstructs the dirty page table and the transaction table as of the time when the crash happened. So the goal is after the analysis phase, after, the, um, after you're done reading the log once, you have a version of the DPT and the TT. Yeah? Of course, those um, structures were kept in main memory and if you had a power failure, for instance, they're lost, right? So you have to reconstruct those tables. And that is a job of the analysis phase, reconstructing those two tables, reflecting the state of dirty pages and transactions at the time of the crash. So when you have those tables, you know, those are the loser transactions. You know, everybody who is recorded in um, this transaction table looks like a pie on the slide, right? On this transaction table, those are loser transactions, whereas those um, records here in the dirty page table, those are the possibly problematic pages you have to reinvestigate in the database store. Yeah? That is the output here. And the second information that's being computed is, this, um, is a value called the min dirty page LSN. That is the earliest possible problem in the store. That is the earliest change over all pages that may have created a problem. So if you um, might do have a, where do I have that? I can show you here. So basically, um, this is how the analysis phase, just look at the top uh, line here. This is how the analysis phase computes this value. So if you have your dirty page table and for, all the entries there, you re record the first log sequence number that let that page become dirty, you just take the minimum. So the oldest value, the oldest log record that made the first page dirty, that is this number that we compute here. And that is the starting point for the redo. Yeah, that is where I have to, in the redo phase, continue, um, uh, no, not continue. That is where in the redo phase, I have to start processing the log. Now that's what I want to find out because I don't want to read the entire log again. I just know that I can start here. I won't miss out anything because everything before that point in time has already been, uh, been applied to the database store. So there can't be any problem. Problems may only happen starting at this point in time, but not any earlier. So that's a trick I'm playing here. If we go back here to this overview to compute the starting point for the redo phase, yeah? getting back those tables and getting the starting point. Then in the redo phase, the, the overall idea is that I repeat all actions and, and, and apply them again to the database store. So repeat really in the sense of applying them to the database store. Those um, changes do not have to be forced to disk. So I reply them in the database buffer and I don't care what the database buffer does, it, whether it uh, spills pages, uh, writes pages back to, to disk or not, I really don't care. Yeah? It just reapplies them uh, to those pages. Some of them get written out, others don't. Yes, the algorithm still works. So I repeat all actions. And the all part is important because you might think, hmm, why do I actually repeat the actions from user transactions, right? That's not the idea. Um, the idea of the algorithm is um, really to um, apply each and every action at this point in time. I don't care about who is the loser or winner at that point in time. Um, that gives me certain degrees of freedom and, 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 and tweaking the algorithm. For the moment, the idea is really, I wanna get back to the state where I was in when the crash happened. So I basically reconstruct the precise moment in time before the crash happened. So the last record, uh, I'm, uh, up to the last record being created in the log file, I will reapply everything and then I'm exactly back in the state I was in when the crash happened. Uh, that is the goal of this phase. And that's also, this paradigm is called repeating history. I repeat each and every um, change 
including winner or loser transactions. There are other algorithms. And depending on um, the locking granularity, you can also um, run algorithms that only repeat changes of the winner transaction. That is uh, possible in certain scenarios. But here I'm saying, no, I don't care. I do. I want to get back to precisely the state I was in. That's the second phase. So now I'm back in the state I was in before the crash. And now the undo phase, all, all that's left to do is, OK, I know from the transaction table, those are my loser transactions. So all I need to do is make sure that the changes those loser transactions did are removed from the database store. Yeah. That is the job of the undo phase. So I undo the actions of all loser transactions. Um, and I lock those. Yeah into compensation log records. So I apply changes to the store. I apply modifications reflecting these, this uh, uh, undo operation. And I lock my changes as compensation uh, log records. That's what I said before. Yeah, so those are artificial log records, not triggered by normal operation. Yeah? Outside of areas, the normal operation of a database system will write out those update and commit log, rec log records. But the normal operation won't write out compensation log records. Compensation log records are written by the Aries method itself in the undo phase. They are written in the undo phase, then they are read later on in, in all of those phases, but they're only considered in the redo phase. Yeah, so if you crash while recovering, yeah, then the redo phase will try to reapply the undo if necessary. Yeah. That's a bit uh, the involved part here, huh? but, but this is a, um, a high level idea of um, those three methods. Okay, and um, I don't know, do we have questions uh, so far? Uh, if not, I will go into the pseudocode. I mean, I, I just recommend you to go to go through these examples. And uh, so I really understand areas only um, once I had to learn it. Uh, when again, going through the examples, yeah, we will do exactly that on Friday in the lab. Uh, and then you will, oh, that we, you will really see whether you understood the method when you look at a concrete log. Uh, with, with a mix of log and compensation and commit uh, log records and then, oh, what happens at this point in time? What does DBT table uh, do? Why it doesn't contain entry for that? How could that happen? Yeah? And then, um, then it should make click. Uh, uh, um. Okay, so let's look at the pseudocode in, in more detail, but basically it's just um, detailing a bit more what I just explained. So again, analysis algorithm. And let's read it from the return for the moment. That's what we have to find out. So the transaction table at the point uh, of the crash, dirty page table at the point of the crash, and this min dirty page LSN. So that's the entry point for the redo phase. So the earliest possible log record that created the first uh, dirty page. That is what we have to find out. And that is what the analysis phase is about. So we start reading the entire log from left to right for the moment from left to right, yeah. um, and it's read-only. We don't change anything in the log. That's also important here. So um, you can ignore this line here for the moment. We don't have that uh, yet. So basically, we start with an empty transaction table, an empty dirty page table, and then we um, inspect the individual log records. So read this line as a for loop. Yeah? So we start for, for all the log records available in the log file. Yeah, uh, until the end of the log, we inspect each and every log record. Yeah? And then for the, um, we, um, if we find a commit log record, what we can do is we remove that transaction from the transaction table. Yeah? That's what I uh, showed to you in the example. Yeah? You, once you find the commit, you remove it from the transaction table because that transaction committed, so it's not an ongoing transaction anymore. If it's um, a commit uh, log record, um, and there's no entry for this transaction. Um, uh, so if, if it's not, sorry, if it's not a commit log record, so any other type of log record, but you don't have it in the transaction table yet, you, you put it in the transaction table. Yeah? It's the first, uh, assume you find an update log record. 
If you find an update log record, but you don't have it in the transaction table, that means that's the first update log record triggered by that transaction. Yeah, So that's an ongoing transaction. You must record it in the transaction table. That, that's what happens here. Um, and then you set the, the last LSN field accordingly. Um, and you also fix the dirty page table. Yeah? So, so log record refers to a, day, a dirty page um, that's not in the dirty page table yet. You must make an entry. So you see, oh, page 42, 42 is touched by that uh, update log record, but it's not in my dirty page table yet. So I must put it in the dirty page table. Yeah? Yeah, like, like that, you keep processing, 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 processing. So all of that is a for loop here, yeah? all of this. Um, nested stuff till here. It's a for loop. You keep processing each and every log record until eventually you processed all the log uh, records, and then you have a version of the DPT and uh, of the TT yeah, of, the, of the transaction table. And then what remain, uh, what has to be done is okay. From the dirty page table, you um, compute the minimum, so the oldest uh, log record making a page dirty, and then you re return those three values. That's it for the analysis phase. Then comes the second phase, the redo phase, and that works as follows. So here you need the lock again and the read only um, mode, and um, you want to have the dirty page table, also read only. So what, what you do is here, you start from the um, this, this entry point we just computed in the analysis phase, and again, look at each and every lock record. And then you do the following, um, then you, then you ask, uh, then you do the following checks, and that big nested if statement, three if statements. So the first thing is, well, if I look at the log record, I curl, I'm currently inspecting this LR dot. Huh? So the page ID that is mentioned there, is that even contained in my dirty page table? Yeah, only if it's contained, you have to do something. If it's not contained, it cannot be a problem because the dirty page table gives you the set of pages that may have a problem. Yeah, but if you now have a log record with a page ID that's not contained in the, in the set, you're done already, over. You can uh, proceed the loop to the no next log, rec uh, log record. Yeah? But now if it's um, contained in that dirty page, well, then you check whether the LSN, the log sequence number of the log record, is greater or equal the one in the dirty page table, which means that this is a more recent change. So the dirty page table contains the first log record that may have been a problem, but now you see a log record that has a, for this particular page, a bigger log sequence number. Oh yeah, then you we have to continue. Huh? Then we have to continue. It's a more recent change than the one uh, in the dirty page table. We, we have to look at that one. Huh? Then what you do is, and only then is, uh, you actually get the page. Yeah? You ask the database buffer, hey, give me that page. There may be a problem with the page. Can I, can I look at that page, please? So the database buffer, either has it already in my memory or have loaded on demand. And then you can inspect the actual page. And only at this point in time, you inspect the page. And that's the strength of the method, yeah? so that you try to delay actually loading the page. So here you check the version available on the header of the page. You check whether, okay, what, what, what version is, there? is that page in any way? And then you can see what, uh, what was the latest change applied to that page that made it to disk. And only if that page version is older than the log record I have in my hands, you are there. Then I still have to apply this log record to the page. Yeah? You see, there's a smaller log record, uh, sorry, a smaller log sequence number on the page, which means an older version than the one I have in my hand with the log record. Then I have to apply the actual um, redo information from that log record. Yeah? So here, only then I apply the redo action to that. And then I also fix the version number of the page to the current one. And this must be transactional. Yeah? You get all kinds of problems if you don't do that, yeah? depending on how you log. But in general, this better be some sort of transactional concept. Yeah? Otherwise, uh, if you record the new version and uh, don't do apply the change uh, and the other way around, uh, you see what it leads to. So that's the redo algorithm. Then comes the undo algorithm. Um, it needs a log. And as I said, it will have to append things to the logs, these compensation log records. So the read-only mode is not enough. And it will need the transaction table. Why? Because it has to know what are my loser transactions. What are the transactions that I need to remove 
from the database store, uh, not the transactions, but the changes uh, done, the changes triggered by those loser transactions have to be removed, of course. Huh? And how the stunts basically, you do a backward scan starting from the last log entry and uh, in reverse direction, jumping from just jumping uh, from one relevant log record to another. So basically, you create a heap where the priority is uh, uh, more recent log record, so the highest or latest log record uh, comes first. So basically, you you jump backwards over that. Um, so the heap basically gives you the next log record to consider. So you initialize the heap basically with, with all the transactions and their, their uh, log records recorded in the transaction table. So the last, for each transaction in the transaction table, you have the last log record that was written out and you use that to initialize your heap. And then you keep on drawing from the heap. Yeah? So the, the next youngest log record from any loser transaction that we have to consider. Yeah, that's what you do here. So you basically jump, only jump over the loser transactions and you completely ignore the winner transactions because you don't care, right? It's just about the loser transactions um, and that's uh, what the heap uh, gives you here. So why that heap still contains element? While it's not empty, that's this line, you pop the next element. So the most recent log entry, yeah, the, the LSN, the highest, uh, the log entry with the highest LSN, you remove it from that heap. Then um, you get the transaction ID, yeah, some loser transaction, and the uh, um, last LSN here. Um, you get um, the corresponding log record from the log file. So you have to have some, basically this, you can translate that into a seek operation. Uh, I mean, that, that eventually translates into a more efficient sequential scan. You won't hop from byte 42 to 77, stuff like that. Uh, as this page oriented, it will more or less translate um, to a, a sequential backward scan where you can hopefully hop over larger uh, holes only containing uh, winner transactions. And then you make, um, you first check whether it's a compensation log record. If that is, um, maybe let's first um, look at the case where it's a standard log record. That's the else branch. It's a, if it's a standard log record, then here we see what, what I explained before already. We write a compensation log record. Yeah, so recording the change we do to the store, apply that undo action described in, in that log record to the database store and add the next log record to be undone for that transaction to the heap. Yeah? So basically we did one step from right to left from most recent to oldest for this transaction. We, we, we um, undid the change in the store, we wrote a corresponding compensation log record and then we put the new entry on the heap for the next round. Uh, that's basically the, the handling of a standard undo operation. However, if, we, uh, if the log record we read here as a compensation log record, we basically um, check whether there's a next operation to be undone for this transaction that is recorded in that undo next LSN. Yeah, if that's uh, not equal now, we basically um, put a, another entry to the heap. If that is null, again, it means we, we are done processing that transaction. So all the compensation, log, all uh, undo records were compensated for. That was the last compensation record uh, compensating the first update record ever uh, created by that transaction. So basically we can remove that transaction from the, um, um, from the transaction table because it was completely uh, compensated. Yeah, that's, that's the idea of that undo algorithm. And uh, yeah, if you now have crashes like that, if you crash in the middle, um, you, um, now you can, can think what happens, yeah? in particular in this situation. Someone an idea what happens? We still have uh, two minutes. Oh, we're running out of time, I'm <laughs> seeing. Yeah? Maybe we do that in the lab and then we see what, what happens uh, in these situations. Okay, but um, <clears throat> maybe just to wrap up, how are we doing time-wise, six minutes? I think that's okay. Um, so this is what we had so far. Yeah, so this is uh, um, starting points. And now the problem still is the analysis phase has to read the entire log. And um, what I how I can optimize the algorithm is to make sure that 
uh, in the analysis phase, I don't read the entire log. How would that work? The idea is I eventually I write the current state of the um, dirty page table and the transaction table to the log. And that is called a fuzzy checkpoint. So basically, in normal operation, while collecting up, while performing updates and while um, writing out update log records, I write out the current state of my dirty page table and the transaction table to the log file. And recall, the, the purpose of the anal analysis phase is to reconstruct the dirty page table, the transaction table, and this uh, min dirty page LSM. So now if I start the analysis phase, only thing I have to do is I go to the most recent version of the dirty page table and transaction table I find in the log file. That may be this one. There may be other versions, older versions of that. I record somewhere that that is the most um, uh, recent version. I start with that and then I run the analysis phase from that point in time. That is the idea here in this phase. So basically, that's what we had so far. Analysis starts from the beginning of the log. Now, I start much, much later, much, much later. So I save some time here. This does not affect the redo and undo phases, so, yeah? Because the re redo phase depends on, okay, what was the earliest um, dirty page, yeah? the earliest um, update making a page dirty. And the undo phase depends on, okay, from all the loser transactions at this point in time, which of those transactions, which was the first change done by those loser transactions? That's this one. And that's not so easy to determine huh? because you have to really go through the log for the different um, loser transactions. Yeah? So, but what we uh, gained was at least here the analysis phase starts later. Yeah? And um, how that is done, um, and you will also see that in the exercise on Friday is actually a fuzzy checkpoint um, consists of two entries in the log. So the first is saying it's a small entry uh, writing a begin checkpoint and that signals a point in time, the version we are about to write to the log. So what? Um, so that's the first log entry being, being written. Concurrently, other transactions will be writing update uh, log records, commit log, log records, whatsoever. But then in the second part, second log, second log entry, um, for the fuzzy checkpoint, you will actually write a copy of the dirty page table and the transaction table. But what you write here in the second part is as of this point in time. Yeah, so there might have been, you, you may find other update log records in between that may also affect the dirty page table and the transaction table. But how this is done is um, you first write it out here. Basically, you're preparing uh, this fuzzy checkpoint here then other update records may uh, happen here, and then you write out um, the, the version of the DPT and TTS of this point in time. That's how it was done. I mean, there are many, you, you can find reasons for doing that and reasons for not doing that. It would be easier to write it as, uh, as one entry, but the idea was here um, that that may take time to copy it, and you didn't want to block concurrent transactions. That's why people uh, did it like that. Yeah. Yeah, there are other optimizations that you can do. So if you're in this situation now um, and you want to um, make those different phases cheaper, you could use a background write thread. Yeah? What would a background write thread do? So the dirty pages you find in your buffer, you should write them out yeah, regularly. What will, what will happen? The, um, the version diverge. Yeah? So if you never, if you only write out dirty pages um, when they are evicted from the buffer, it may happen that the, the version in main memory is much, much younger than the version on disk. So it's a huge diverge of the versions. But if you regularly write out those ver versions, so even for dirty pages in the buffer that do, are not evicted, you write them out to disk, um, then you have the effect that the redo will fa uh, phase will, um, oops, the redo phase will start, I uh, don't see the difference here. So here the redo phase started uh, like in the middle of the page, yeah? but now if you have a background thread, you may start later in the log file yeah? because uh, the difference is not so stark anymore. Huh? And the question is for undo, what can you do? Well, here it, undo actually can also be read like, okay, there's at least one transaction that at the time when the system crashed, 
started already at this point in time. So that's a relatively large gap and that can typically be um, fixed by allowing users to only submit short running transactions. Yeah? So think about a scenario where on a web front end you open a form, you enter stuff and already when opening you send begin um, transaction to the database system. And then the user does something, types something, takes hours, grabs a coffee, eventually hits commit. Yes, that's a long running transaction. So a better scenario could be, it depends on the application though, could be to only send data, to only start the transaction once you actually want to update data in the database system. And that's called a short running transaction. And that would change the undo phase here. It would make it much shorter and would also make um, um, recovery much cheaper in this scenario. Okay, so here's my summary. So we learned about logging actions to a persistent medium, and that's a corner uh, stone for crash, crash recovery. It's an H missing. Crash recovery. Yeah? So different algorithms you can do um, can support using logging. We, we looked at a, a quite advanced one, and that's called ARIES. Yeah? That's a state-of-the-art method for crash recovery in disk-based database systems. It's a beautiful and flexible method. Um, it's, and it's a building block for efficient recovery and high availability. Yeah? That's what you really want to have in a database system. Yeah? Whatever happens, you want to get back to a consistent state automatically. And ARIES does exactly that. While at the same time supporting fine granular locking and, uh, and concurrent uh, transactions, um, stuff like that. It follows a repeating history paradigm. So that's important. You really reconstruct the database um, store as of the time the crash happened. Yeah? You don't already split it up into those are my winner and loser transactions. You really replay everything, including the actions performed by the loser transactions. And only then, in the third phase, the undo phase, you remove stuff done by, undo tran by uh, loser transactions. Variance of the algorithm is used in all major database products. You'll find it in, in different shades um, everywhere. And, and also the algorithmic ideas. Yeah, even if you don't um, look at database systems, you, you find them in many, many software products these days. So. However, keep in mind that for main memory systems, uh, they can be uh, tuned towards um, logging um, more logically. Yeah? You can still run a, an Aries variant, but you probably want to go more towards uh, logical logging and think twice. Uh, whether you um, have physical information or just the pure logical log um, information. And a footnote, uh, that's also here, you might realize now at this point in time, when people talk about main memory systems, well, how can you do a main memory system if you want to support updates? Maybe the stores in main memory, but the stable storage log must be on a persist uh, uh, persistent medium. Yeah, so even if it uh, is um, advertised as a main memory system, you have to lock on, on a durable medium. Yeah? And that's the flash disk and the hard disk. So even main memory systems, if they allow you to do inserts, writes, um, uh, deletes, updates, will have to write out something. It's not purely main memory. Okay, that was it for today. Thanks for your attention. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in the lab. Go through this uh, carefully. Uh, it's fully clear you will need another round probably through the algorithm to really understand it, but it's a beautiful algorithm. It looks complex in the beginning, but once you understand the core concepts, you will see it's, it's a beautiful um, and flexible idea. So stay healthy. We will meet again Friday, 12.15 in the lab. Bye-bye.